Good evening, my fellow Toastmasters and most welcome guests. Welcome to Toastmasters on Purpose, our evaluation, how to evaluate and master your evaluations this evening. Just a reminder again, if you haven't turned off your electronic device, if you please do so, so we don't interrupt our presenters. And we won't have to confiscate your cell phone because Iqbal Acha, who's our program quality director, said that if any cell phone goes off during an event, he's going to confiscate them, he's going to take them to the fall conference, and he's going to put all the cell phones into the silent auction. So just keep that in mind. If your cell phone goes off, Iqbal will be here outside the door to confiscate your cell phone. Keep that, I'm just saying, keep that top of mind. Has it happened yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> it happened up in Lincolnshire, though. <laughs> okay, so let me give you kind of a rundown of what's going to happen this evening. The first half of the meeting, Virginia's going to cover that, and then we're going to kind of segue into it. We actually have the two V's presenting tonight, and I will read you their bios in just a moment. So Virginia will cover the first part of it. You can look at your agenda, and she'll explain more in detail exactly what she's going to cover, and then Val will cover the next part of the meeting. How many of you really think that evaluations are critical to becoming a more effective speaker? Good, I'm glad to see every hand raised because no matter how long we're in Toastmasters or how little we're in Toastmasters, we can always improve on our evaluations. And by coming, becoming better evaluators, we also become much, much better speakers because if you think about it, you're using three of your skills. Anybody know what those three skills are? Sign up. Listening. Right, Donna? What else? Thinking. So listening, thinking, and? Speaking. Speaking. You get to practice all three of those skills when you're an evaluator. So even if you're not, even if you're not a prepared speaker, and you're evaluating the speaker, you get to speak anyway. So evaluation is a tough stroll in the Toastmasters Club. The evaluator must listen carefully. He has to quickly form an opinion about the speaker's strengths and weakness, and of course, and then present, as Valerie and Virginia will cover, an organized extemporaneous speech that's sincere, positive, and helpful. Poor evaluations? Well, we've all heard some really poor evaluations that weren't very good. So let me introduce our two presenters this evening. Our first presenter this evening is Virginia Bosserm, a distinguished Toastmaster. She actually joined Toastmasters in 2010. She belongs to three Toastmasters clubs. She belongs to Club Toast at UL, Look Who's Talking at Gurney, and of course, Toastmasters on Purpose here at Hopper College. She's been the Vice President of PR, she's been a Treasurer, she's been a President, Vice President of Membership, Secretary, and multiple times Vice President of Education. This year, she's Vice President of Education, and she's also President of Top Toastmasters, and then she's an officer at another club. She's also a past area governor of North 44, a past youth leadership program chair, and she completed her DTM in less than three years. The average distinguished Toastmaster, it takes them between six to eight years. So I would say she's been on a fast track, wouldn't you? Yes. yes. She's been an employee at Underwriters Laboratory for over 28 years now? Yes. 28 years. She's held various management <coughs> positions. And one of her side jobs at UL, or was, conducting leadership training for management and team building programs for all the staff. It's a welcome break from her, J for her day job as a DQ. No, I'm sorry, that's data governor. The other DQ is something else for the customer master. So please help me welcome to the lectern, distinguished Toastmaster, Virginia Foster. I have no idea why I did my DTM so fast. I think it's because I finished my CC so fast. I finished my CC in four months. Oh my gosh. Be there's always a reason. Because my icebreaker was so horrible, and I thought I was having a heart attack while I was giving it, and I couldn't see any of the words on the page. And I figured the only way to get over that 
was to keep doing it until that stopped. And so for the, I pretty much did a speech almost every week until, unfortunately Christmas was in there, so I got a couple of weeks off. And then after I finished it, people told me you can rework a speech and give it again. No, I had to do 10 separate speeches. So it just, and it wasn't even planned to do the DTM. I just kept doing these advanced manuals and well, the rest is history. So if you don't think you can do it, you can do it. So what I'm going to do tonight first is I'm going to go over the judging for the evaluation contest. I wasn't going to, because this isn't about winning a contest. It's about giving better evaluations in your club, and if you're in a contest, in your contest. However, I know there are several people here who are competing, and I have already had this presentation prepared, so we will go through it rather quickly. So, <coughs> if you guys would pass out the judging form, we're going to quickly go through that and after we go through that we are I'm going to invite Val to come up here and we're going to go through some judging tips and some judging forms that Top has had in the past that we that we use now so that if you ever want to come back to Top and give a speech, you'll be prepared as to how we do it. And then Val has even found some forms out on the internet. And then we'll discuss the new ruling about using forms in the contest so that everybody is clear about that. And then I will sit down and Val will, well, we'll have a break. And then Val will come up here, and we're going to go through some clips of some speeches and evaluations so that we can then all look at them at the same time. We don't have to worry about hurting anybody's feelings because nobody there has, is in the room. Well, you know, if you pick at it too much, people start to get a little uncomfortable then uh, we'll all have a chance to then participate and, and see what we think compared to what the evaluator thinks. Okay? So that's pretty much tonight. Of course, we'll open it up for questions and answers. All right, so, seriously? It went to sleep. Yeah. I bored it and it went to sleep. <laughs> All right. So let's just understand the judging criteria. Now I have to start off by saying that even though judges go to judges training, there's a lot that is supposed to happen. It's not a guarantee. Because we're all people and we all have different opinions on things. So, yeah, they're supposed to use the guide and the ballot. But some people just use that as a suggestion. And they have their own system for deciding who ranks first, second, and third. Right? And there's no Toastmasters police that go through the audience, or the ballot counters don't get the top part of the form, so they have no idea what methodology anyone has, has used. But it's still a good idea to understand <coughs> what they're supposed to be using because most of them will use the form as a guide. All right, and so they should follow the suggested point values. Some people use hash marks or they use stars or pluses and minuses just to give an idea as to which speaker or what part of the speech was better than another. But in the end, they're going to, when it comes to putting one, two, and three, yeah, they'll add up the points, but as they're going down, they might say, well, no, it was really better than that, and they'll be changing it because they have their own gut feeling. The numbers help them. But in the end, they may have been too low on the first one because it was the first person out. And they may realize that by the time they get to the last person that the first person was really a stronger speaker. So you always have that human factor in there, right? 
So just be aware of that. It's not, not a perfect science. So if you look at your form, you can see that 40%, almost half of the points that the judges are supposed to be using is on your analytical process and what you have shared. So that you really pay attention and we're studying them to see what they were doing and what perhaps could be done about it. Which comes to the next area, which are your recommendations. Okay? So what are you giving that speaker to help them improve? So we don't want to say things like, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. We want to say, you did this and it was good. But if you changed it and did it this way, that would really knock it out of the park, right? Because it's more of a, it's a feedback tool that's more like a coaching tool, right? So that reminds me, you always want to tell them what they did right. And I'm not just talking about contests here, I'm talking about evaluations in general. If we don't focus on what the person did really well, then how do they know to do that again in the future? If it was ignored, then maybe they'll never do it again. And maybe that was really effective. So if they're using their voice effectively, or if they have a certain gesture that they made that really drove the point home, tell them that. Because in the club, other people are new, and they would never think of doing that, because that's what the evaluation is all about. <clears throat> it's for the person who gave the speech, and it's for the rest of the audience to learn. Okay? Have you ever sat in the audience and had an evaluator evaluate someone else Say something that someone told you in an evaluation that didn't make sense, and all of a sudden you go, that's what moving with purpose means. That's what such and such means. Oh, that's what I was doing. Because we're not always fortunate enough to have somebody like Tim videotaping us. And so when the evaluator says, you're going like this all the time, and if that's something that you're not noticing, you're like, I don't think I did that. I don't think that evaluator was nuts. Because okay? we sometimes do it so often, it, it's a habit. <coughs> so then, what's your technique? So what, what do you think that is? Your technique is how you actually give the evaluation. Right? So are you more like a coach? Are you, uh, are you very structured and very organized? Do you use humor? Are you very affable? Are you speaking to the audience and to the individual? Some people think it's better to do the evaluation in first person. Some people think it's better to do it in third person. It's all whatever you prefer, but they're going to notice it. Especially, I was at a contest once where everybody else did it one way, and somebody else talked about the person in the evaluation as if they weren't even there. It was a great evaluation, except that they totally ignored the person who had been speaking, and really spoke as if the person wasn't there. And I thought that was really odd, and obviously they didn't. And then the final point is your summation. And this was something that I figured out a long time ago, that I had to know my opening and my summation. If I saw the cards change, I have to get that summation in, because 15 points could be the difference between one person winning and another. And a lot of people, as soon as that card comes up, they panic and they end. So it's something to realize when the yellow card comes up that I have to get to my summation quickly. Maybe I don't get to give that fourth point. Okay, so that's something you want to try to always work in, even if it's a short conclusion. 
give a conclusion because that may be the one thing that's at the bottom of the form that, and it's something that I pay attention to. If I look at mine when I'm judging and only one person actually had a summation, that tells me something, right? Everybody else missed up. So keep that in mind when you're planning your, your evaluations. Uh, of course, in the club, you know, we don't have to worry if we're 15 seconds over, but trust me, you have to worry if your speech is 15 seconds over. So analytical, is it clear, is it focused? Are you giving specific feedback? And that is not just in speech evaluations. That's in any kind of feedback. If I say, Jerry, thanks for helping. He might say, okay, you're welcome. If I say, Jerry, thanks for going out and getting the bottle of water. We appreciate it. Now he knows exactly what he did. The same thing when you're working with people. If someone does a project and you just say, well, that was a great project, but you didn't tell them exactly what it was that was great about it, how do they know what they should do in the future? Right? So we, we need to get into the habit of having specific points that we thought that they did well and then how they could improve upon that. Um, and then, obviously, we want to present clearly and logically. We don't want to wander around, which is why we do table topics, right? So we learn how to form our opinion and, and speak clearly and concisely. So we don't want to start with the opening, somehow jump to the conclusion, and then go back to the opening again, because the person listening is going to get totally confused, and so will the audience. All right? So these are just basics. I'm sure you've all used these, even in your club context. But the recommendations, are they helpful? Well, I would hope so. I don't know why you would give a recommendation that isn't helpful. But is it really going to help them improve? Or is it just an opinion? Um, for instance, Donna, I hope you don't mind me calling on you. No. But Donna visited my club at UL today, and she asked for a round robin. And I thought that some of the advice that she was given was perhaps not the best advice, and I don't think she should change her speech the way they were saying it. But of course, as a Toastmaster, I could not say that to them. We had to let the round robin go. So, you know, just because you have an opinion about something doesn't mean that that's going to be great advice for the person. So we want to make sure that it's actually good advice that is going to be helpful. And you're going to focus on helping them with their future speeches. So if they know what they did well, and that that's a strength, then they know they should think about adding that to other speeches. And if they know that they do something, like I have a tendency of putting my foot out because my other foot hurts, so that is apparently not a very effective stance, I'll try not to do that until my foot hurts and then I'm going to do that. But if that was something that was annoying to the audience, then I might work on that. I used to have dinosaur arms, where I kept my arms down and just did gestures this way. That's not very effective. And that was one of the things that someone told Donna not to raise her arms up. And I was Above like, my waist. What? That's not a good, that's not a good advice. So we want to make sure that we're giving good advice that will help them with their future speeches. Um, and then our technique. Are we a sympathetic type of speaker? Are we a motivational speaker? This was a great speech, and I know that you're going to be able to take this and do this with it and do that with it. And if that's how you give evaluations, you should be natural and you should do that. But that's what the judges are looking at. They're, they're comparing of what they think is effective, what they think is a good evaluation, and again, some of that is going to be their opinion. But you do want to inspire and encourage the person to continue speaking, to try some of these things, to develop their skills, and that's what it's all about. And then, again, you need to have a summation, because it's so abrupt if you don't. 
It's like getting an email that's not signed, right? Or a, a form letter. But think of the person getting the evaluation. They don't typically have a pad of paper. So they're trying to remember all the things that you're saying to them. So if you wrap it up at the end with the strongest points, that will help them in the future. Right? But that's one reason why your summation is so important. Contest or no contest. Do that in your club as well. And I, I might as well say this now. In the clubs, I've noticed that a lot of people take the manual, they fill it out, they come up, and they literally go down the questions in the manual. Yes, you did this. Yes, you did that. Well, we need to try to make our evaluations in our clubs like an evaluation contest, where we use the manual as our guide. The person can read all of your comments later. Pick out the things that are really effective and use that in your verbal evaluation so the other people in the club can also learn because they watch the speech with you and that will help them learn what to do. All right. So remember, you only have 210 seconds. Use them wisely. A lot of people used to, not so much anymore, but they used to get up and after they thanked everybody, they would then thank the speaker for giving up of their time to come and be a target speaker at our club and we so, and I'm, the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking. So you want to get right to it and you don't need to basically re-say the speech. You need to say what was effective or what you can help them with. Don't go through, you're not proving that you listen to the whole speech. You're helping them, you're coaching them. And your summation theoretically would be 30 seconds, but trust me, usually it's only about 20 seconds because the card goes up, you finish your point, and then you jump into your summation. So when you're taking your notes in that five minutes, think about how you want to leave it. So that if you have to jump to that, you can, and you don't have an abrupt ending. Use time wisely, don't waste time on fillers. Um, so, and this is an interesting thing. Evaluations are pretty much how we teach in Toastmasters. There's no instructor up here. Uh, it's the person giving a speech and someone giving an evaluation and coaching them. And so, it's an interesting concept to think that that's really what they're all about. They're a teaching tool, right? And nobody ever liked the teachers that were overly critical and just said negative things, right? So we want to make sure, again, I can't stress it enough, that we're giving positive feedback of what they did well, okay? And of course, we have to have a summation in case you forget. Uh, know your criteria, so know, uh, now you have a copy of the form, so you understand <coughs> that. You know how to break up your time, right? And where the points, where you should focus, right? And then um, just think of the fact that you want to teach your speaker <coughs> and the audience well. And good luck in your contest. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about that? Before I move on. Yeah, Donna. And maybe this is for question and answer. But when you coming to your summation, should huh? you say in summary? You can. You can, certainly. Yeah. Or you can use another phrase and to wrap this up or okay. you know, something that I'd really like you to take away from this. You know, so but absolutely. Yeah, Bob. Is there a ratio between how many positive comments you make to how many uh, comments you make to I think that comments where they can improve themselves should also be positive. <laughs> so uh, so go out there and cut everything they do great and then summarize and tell them two things they did wrong. No, no, that's not 
you know, you want to balance it out. What? 50-50? Okay, so I have won my division and I've placed a district. I'm not an expert. Everybody has a good day, everybody has a bad day. I can tell you on the break how awful I did one year in our evaluation contest here at top, where I said, I got nothing, and I sat down. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was terrible, because I hated, I hated the person's speech, and I was so obsessed with, with how much I hated their speech that when I got up, I couldn't think of anything nice to say, and I kind of went through it, and I knew that I had blown it, and I just said, I got nothing. So if I say six things positive, I should say six things that could be uh, Probably won't have time. <laughs> no. Won't have time no. to do that many. Maybe Is three. there a ratio involved here? For me, I think people remember three things. I can pretty much remember three things I needed at the grocery store without writing them down. <laughs> Any more than that, I'm lost. So I would say pick out the three that you think will give them the most help, will be most effective and think of the things that they did. Chances are a target speaker has not finished their CC, so they're still learning, but there should be at least one or two things that if you found out that person was giving their second speech, you'd go, holy cow, are you kidding me? You already did this and this and this. So point out a, you know, two or three of those things, and then if there's something you can improve upon, do that as well. But I would not, so when you get to your summation, you know, you want to say, you should continue doing this, that was very effective, and do that, and then what you might consider doing is the blah, 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 blah. Well, an example, an example of that would be too, because in Donna's contest, at the area contest, the guy that she competed against, we were talking about that today, he gave 20. Yeah. Launch <laughs> right. oh. Now, unless Thanks. somebody was filming. And of course, I was sitting there going, I didn't say that, I didn't say that, I didn't say that, I'm going to lose. But out of those 20, how many were really right. important? Right? Some were just opinions. You know? Virginia, you shouldn't have worn black. You should have worn red today. Okay, thank you. Right? The other, the other comment I was thinking about, because in Mount Prospect, there was a member, his name was Ken Uting. He was a long-standing Toastmaster. He was in Toastmasters for probably, at that point, 20, 28 years. Do you remember him, Don? No, Ken I never remember. That was before him. And he used to call it report and repeat. Virginia was talking about how some evaluators will just repeat what the speaker said. Yeah, yeah the story. You hear that all the time. Yeah. All the time. Like, they call, they call that, yeah, they call it yeah. report and repeat. You're just repeating what the person said, right. but you aren't really giving them And then any, you said this, and then you did right. this, and then you said that, and it's like... But unless when you said that, it helped me realize right. that... This is your grandmother, and she was sick, and whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that when you give an evaluation, I'm not supposed to evaluate the speech, but how they gave the speech to uh, the speech. So give them, like, get to the point is, is one, what is it, number two, or number three? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, the evaluation should be done to how well they did to get to the point. But when you're in a contest, you have no idea just know which of the ten projects yeah, they're right. doing. Oh, you know, See, and that's, and that's what I'm things. saying, that we, we get so <laughs> caught up with what we're learning on that project and those ten things in the, in the book that we, we need to use that as a guide and put that down and put it as if you were going to do it in a contest. Because the person can read all those and they can look at all the check boxes. But we have to get better at, at just speaking it in a, in a way that helps everyone. Because the other people aren't sitting there with the checklist. So a lot of times they don't know what you're talking about. Can I add to Sure. When you're giving things that, that you like, that they're doing well, I'd say maybe three to four things. Because again, it depends on how deep you're going to go. Mm -hmm. So something might be, you know, you have a really nice presence, and you, you might say a couple more sentences. And then you're going to talk about the story, and you're going to analyze the story, and you can go deeper into that. So you're going to, because you have to analyze the speech too. So you have to have, make sure you have enough time to do that. Then when you go to the recommendations, I'd say two to three at the most. At the most. At the most. Mm -hmm. 
Two to three. Three is the max because yeah. they can't remember more than that. And you might get discouraged too. Right. Well, that's the other thing. They have to do 20 things differently. Well, gosh, I guess my speech was awful. And it probably wasn't. But you're not going to just tell them what they can improve. You're going to show them how, how. to do it. And so that's going to take up more time. Exactly. It's like if you say, oh, well, you were you know, kind of going back and forth. And what you really want to do is walk with purpose. And then you move to the next thing, and the person is like, OK, can I Google walk with purpose? What is walk with purpose? <laughs> right? So what you need to say is, well, when you made that point about your mother, you could have stood over here and told her part of the story. And then when you made that point about your father, you could have come over here. And then when you had your conclusion, you could have come right here to the center. And that way, people know that this is one part of the story, this is another part of the story, and this being your, your more powerful position is where you're going to make your point. Now, do you have to do it that way? No. You could have something that happens over here and then something else that happens over there, and you could make your point still being over there. And the way you get around that, we learned at one of our other workshops, is with your belly button. It's hard to find mine, but I know it's there. It's just well padded. If you use your body, so I could still be over here, but if I face this way, the people over there are still getting my attention. Right? So you, if you don't have to always go all the way over to the end of the stage to speak to them, you just turn and face them. Yeah. We are jumping from the contest to the, the projects. One of the suggestions I would say for evaluations in the project, the getting comfortable with visual aids, I don't remember which number. Mm -hmm. I used to sell medical equipment, so I had long shoe horns, bath chairs, all these wonderful things. My evaluator said, well, you should have gotten comfortable using the overhead and that doing media. That's not the requirement. And it's like, she didn't mention at all that I'm talking about safety in the home. Why see a slide? Right. See the toilet seat that's going to save your life. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody else said, well, I thought it was bad with all the toys. Well, okay. Maybe you didn't like it. Right. And I was a general evaluator for that, right. so of course I got to evaluate him. Right. And I brought it to his attention that there's no such thing whenever anyone is up there, we as evaluators, we're never saying, I didn't like that because it was bad. Or you did this bad. No, there's always room to improve. Right. And this was and a Toastmaster for like 21 years that said, well, you, what it was all that stuff. You should be using the overhead. For Why? I've never done that. Some people hate PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah, like me. Our CEO will walk into the meeting and say, turn it off and tell me what you're going to say. Don't let the slides do it. So when you evaluate, be specific. Right. Be and specific. Don't say, I'm using what is needed. It meets the criteria. Right. Don't overpick. Right. Suggest maybe you should learn how to use it, and that would help a lot more. Yeah. They also, what happens, Neil, sometimes is that, to your point about the project they're on, they'll evaluate that person at a different level. They'll oh, yeah. bring things into the evaluation that have nothing to do with that particular project. That was only my second speech. I went yeah. from icebreaker right to that one. Oh, you skipped that. So I, yeah. I skip all over. But yeah. Now, the only the time, Jerry, that I, I mention things that aren't in the project is if it's their first or second speech and they've already accomplished something in the seventh right. or eighth, I'll bring up that you're already doing something that most people don't even start practicing until their seventh or eighth speech. I will do that, right. but yeah, it's unfair. <coughs> okay. okay, so now, oh, Tim? Yeah, you know, a lot of times when I try to give very specific evaluations mm -hmm. for somebody who I really want to help, Right. They never win the contest, or, or they never work, work out. Oh, you, you know, mean you never win the contest. <laughs> I, or, or something like that. <laughs> what am I missing in something like that? I mean, is there a difference between actually helping the speaker and crafting it for a wider evaluation audience? I think it's that you have to give them positive mm -hmm. feedback and what, how it was effective, what they did that was great, and then when you give the improvement feedback, you 
Don't start off with what you need to improve upon. Start with, while what you did was effective, what you might want to consider is, okay, so I think it's all, isn't this true with even our regular conversations? <coughs> it's how we say it. Mm -hmm. Are we saying it that we do appreciate it, but really you need to use the mop and water when you're cleaning the floor, not just a Swifter, right? Um, get, anybody had teenagers? They think anything can be done with a Swifter, yeah. <laughs> including a shower stall. So, um, <laughs> you know, so it, it's how we say it. So what I would do is if you were recorded, I would look at that recording and compare it to what you what we're just talking about and see did I give enough positive feedback to balance out the improvement and is there a way of rephrasing the improvement suggestions mm -hmm. to still be positive and it you have to think about it and you have to practice it you know um, okay all right we need to move on oh okay sorry one last okay I just want to say this was very good because I always thought the person that gave the most suggestions for improvement was the best evaluator. So this has been very helpful to I me. I like that. So just pick the most important ones. Yes. All right, so now what I'd like to pass out is the form we currently use at <coughs> TOP. So here at TOP, if you've never visited us before for a regular meeting, we don't do table topics. We don't do word of the day. We don't have an op counter. We don't have a snack work master. What we do is we do speeches and evaluations. And we really focus on evaluations because when you think about it, most of the people in the club have either done speaking in their profession or they have completed their CC manual. So they've already done the education part. What they want is they want a, a better evaluation, a more comprehensive evaluation to help them move to the next level in their speaking. All right? So this is the form that we focus on. On one side it has content, and on the other side it has delivery. One person gives the content evaluation. The other person gives the delivery evaluation. And then we have a round robin where everyone in the room, including guests, are asked to contribute to if they had another idea on top of what someone else has said. The Toastmasters International has put in their new rule book that there is a form that we should be using at all of our speech evaluation contests. And I can say that it has not been consistent in the contests that I have been helping out at. Some of them know nothing about the form. My area contest, we were required to use the form. Only one sheet, if I correct. Just that this one. form. It's one page. But you can't use two of those pages. No. no just the one. Unless, okay, unless, unless they give everybody two pages. <laughs> that I didn't hear. Okay. Okay. So you can't it have a... It has to be equal. It has to be fair, fair to everyone. everyone. Uh, you can't bring a blank sheet of paper for your scribble notes and then use this for your other notes. What I was told was to do my scribble notes on the back and the ones I'm going to use in the room on the front. You may or may not experience this because it has not been consistent this year. I'm pretty sure in the future it will be very consistent. Val talked to Toastmasters International twice to confirm that this is what we are supposed to be doing. So I didn't want anybody to be shocked when they got to their contest and said, why didn't anybody tell me about this for? Now that being said, that doesn't mean that these other forms, and Val's got some that she'll talk about in a minute, that they're not useful. So I can only tell you my experience. What I do is I know 
the areas of the speech that I'm going to look at. I'm always going to look at the, oh, the, I always write down the title. If it was a super title, I want to tell them it was a super title. I always put something about the opening. So there are certain things. So I took that piece of paper and I put the speaker's name at the top and I put the title and I wrote opening, you know, and body, conclusion, improvements, you know, so that I didn't forget something. Now, I probably <coughs> would have forgotten, but just in case I was spacing out that day, I would remind myself that, oh, did they have conclusion? I'm not sure. So I would suggest that you look at some forms. Um, some other methodologies are to take a piece of paper, divide it into four quadrants. Um, Stan Pistorsky, he always would say, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? And I have no idea what the fourth one was. Um, but something like that. So whatever methodology works for you, write your own at home. It's kind of like writing a grocery list. Even if you leave the grocery list in the car, you're going to remember most of the things on the list. So if you know that there's five things that you particularly want to look for because that's where you feel the meat of the speech is, write that on your blank piece of paper and then do that. So these still have benefit in helping you develop. And it also helps you in developing your speeches. If you have an idea of what the audience is looking for or what might be important to the audience, then that's what's on the form. All right, and so Val is going to go over a couple of other forms before we have our break. No, no I already have them You hand them up. Okay. Did they summarize? 
did they have a call to action? And then so now you've got the format out here because now you know one, two, three, four steps. And then you already have your three points here. So now when you go to give your speech, this is all you need. The bottom. The three points that you like and your two to three points of your recommendations. And then you go into detail. You don't have to write everything out. So this is just an idea for you to, to look at and really try to get that, that, that format in your head. <clears throat> any, any questions on, on this? Were there this more of that one form that you held up for, not that one, the other one? Um, I have some yeah. more here. Oh, okay. Oh. Which one yeah. did you? I need one of those. There's uh, uh, not one. Okay. okay. All right, what we're going to do is take a five minute break. Is that okay? Oh, okay. And then we're going to come back and then do videos. Oh, good. Woo! But no popcorn. Let's go. Maybe she gets it. Welcome back, everyone. We're getting into the second part of the meeting, but first let me introduce our presenter for the second half. You've already met her already, but let me give you a little bit of her background so you get to know Val. First of all, Val is a certified world-class speaking coach and trainer. She's also a licensed master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming, she can explain that to you, which is the study of influence and personal performance. She's also the co-author of World Class Speaking in Action with somebody, I think, by the name of Craig Valentine, who some of you know, of course. Yeah. Valerie's also a member of Toastmaster since 1996. She's a seasoned Toastmaster. And of course, Valerie is a distinguished Toastmaster. Valerie, for some of you who've taken some of her sessions, she also studied improv at Second City, as well as the Long Girl Performing Arts Academy. Valerie also conducts workshops for business professionals on speaking and storytelling using improv and neuro-linguistic programming techniques. So please help me welcome distinguished Toastmaster Valerie Fusai. Well, I'm not going to talk a lot. It's like my improv. We're just going to do, we're going to have everyone else do work. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to tell you the new book is out, the rule book. If you're competing, definitely every year you should download it and read it, read it from page to page because there's, there's changes in it. So this is where we found that the new contestant notes are in there. One thing I wanted to add to that is that uh, there were a couple contests that I was in that we were told that the sergeant at arms had to talk to us while we were waiting. And that's not in the rule book. So it's just not in the rule book. But it's up to the contest chair if they want to do that. Uh, so you're going to have it maybe in some contests, but not in others. But it's not, not, it's not something that you have to do. So if you don't want to talk to them, you don't have to talk to them. You can put your earbuds on. Uh, what my theory on that is that. The first speaker gets to go up and present, they just heard the speech. Our district is big. We were six, now we're eight, usually in a competition. Right? Well, it's nine. 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 So now we're nine. By the time the ninth person gets up, if they've had to talk to somebody for nine speakers, do they remember what that speech was? No. So who is now at a disadvantage? So that's just, just my opinion. What we're going to do is I'm going to show some videos, and Roger's going to show some <coughs> videos. And then we're going to, first I'm going to show you a third place winner of the contest. I went back to our district, I think it was 2011, where Prez won. I'm going to show you the target speaker and Prez as the winner. I'm not going to show the other speakers because 
they're in our district, so I didn't want to, this is going to be on YouTube, I didn't want to evaluate the other speakers. But I am going to show you speakers from other districts. So first, if we want to start with um, the one third place winner, what I want you to do is listen to the speech, and you might start you know, taking some notes on what you thought, that how they presented. We're not listening to her target speaker, we're just listening to her presentation. And take just on some notes. We're going to then move on to, we can just a really quick uh, debrief on it, and then we're going to move on to the, the next one. I don't know if that's the right clip. That's the 2015 spring contest. Yeah, that one. We're going to do that one. Sound is muted, so you might want to unmute it. On the computer, I mean. Minimize the video. Hit the escape key on the keyboard. Right there at the lower left-hand part, the sound, the little speaker on the bottom. It was muted. Now you should be good to go. Any comments on the speech? Yes. 
I, I thought the very ending, instead of ending on something a little positive, to me, it kind of was a negative where I wanted more story. Like, you disappointed me. Versus, it was a wonderful story. You could have expanded it. Might not have been so negative. Right. And that, to me, listening to everything else, that hit me the most. And maybe I got too much of the negativity from mom, but kind of, why end it like that? It could have been a little smoother. <laughs> No, exactly. And she hung out in the area that she said was bad for her, and I thought she was way over there. Or somebody, if they're sitting in the same area, they couldn't see her. Your hand up. Would you have some? Keep your hand up. Who, me? In the summary, she said three things that they did well and never really mentioned any recommendations. And yeah. I think at the end, you should have those recommendations that the people remember that. Mm -hmm. seemed like the focus of the evaluation was on her, not the speaker. How many times did she say, I want it? I want it. It's not about what she wants. The speaker. Have you heard that before? Her speaker is what I want? Yeah. Except that's not a bad point. I mean, she's saying that on behalf of all of us. Right. I wanted more. Now I'm curious what the speech was. That was great. Yeah. That was probably everybody in the room wanted more. Right. It's a matter of words, mm -hmm. yeah. how you use the words. Mm -hmm. So yes, she could have expanded on it, and she started doing that. Mm -hmm. First of all, she didn't really pinpoint some of the things they did really well. It was just it was powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Going along with the I wanted more, I thought, and I haven't seen this speech, I don't know if it went up to the time limit. I'm, I'm wondering if, if she would say, yeah, it, what, what should the speaker sacrifice to get more of the start? I, yeah. you know, like, there had to be some some more specifics around all exactly of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She, kept, she kept turning sideways multiple times away from the kids. We don't know who the target speaker where the speaker was she was speaking to, but she kept saying turn using the staging area. She kept turning sideways and every time she did that, she turned away from the audience. Yeah, she started out pacing, it was distracting. Mm -hmm. Right. No, you were you had something? Yeah, uh, I really agree with everyone everything everyone is saying with regard to uh, she's saying what I want and at some point I'm like who cares what you want like I, I I wanted her to say speaking on behalf of the audience as an audience member this is something I would be looking for so she didn't frame even herself well and I think that reward there the other part was it, who here has seen Chinatown the, the movie Chinatown at one point there's the I'm your mother I'm your daughter I'm your mother I'm your daughter type of thing and it's like whoa you're, you're sending me two messages she said literally it was such a good speech dot 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 I have three things to improve <laughs> like whoa what are you telling me and, and that kind of came through throughout the entirety of the speech and I thought wow well, I'm not even sure what I'm I never had that thing I could grab onto as a speaker to know exactly what I was supposed to do do to him. Right, and so that's at the beginning. She went. I didn't uh, get to record hers because I threw her in at the last minute. Um, so she didn't spend a minute on the, on the on the good qualities. Yeah. She spent maybe a half a minute, and it wasn't even pointing out the good qualities. She just kept repeating, "It was powerful. It was powerful." But what she could say as a story, it would be more impactful if you expanded the story, <clears throat> told us a little bit more about the transformation, and really go into the analytical part of the story, how they could change the story to be more effective, not just that I wanted more. So in, the anal in analyzing your speech, the speech, you have to really be a little more analytical so that they know exactly they leave there what they could do to improve that speech. You really didn't give them that much analysis. Yes, Virginia? Well, I think that also say it was powerful. She could have said it was powerful once and then said what made it powerful. Yeah, there it, is. Yeah. it was your voice. It was your confidence when you came out. It was the subject that was all-consuming. Whatever it was, that made it powerful, so that person knows that that's the skill that they should keep using. But, but didn't but she start out that way? It was she, when we were had volume she issues. Said she said something it was about powerful over and over. She said, "You sharpen the blade." That was the name of the speech. That that's all. But Stephen Covey, like sharp, you know, sharpen the saw. Okay. That was the name of the speech. Yeah. Okay. So she's just saying, "You sharpen the blade." What does that really mean? Okay. I thought she was saying that that was 
you know. That there was, she was something. The, yeah, very popular. Bob, do you have a comment? Yes. The thing I have, you know, everyone's mentioning I, I a lot. Somewhere when I was doing evaluations last year, I was reading a lot, and they said, you can only speak about what I think, what I feel, not what we, because the audience could be totally opposite of what you, the evaluator, saw. So how do you kind of balance the I versus the we, or is it better just do it like I, but not say it as many times as she right. said? What she was saying too much about her, right. but she didn't give structure to how they could change it. It was, I wanted to see this, I wanted to see this, I wanted, but she really didn't go into detail how they personally could change the speech. If the storytelling, there's transformation in the story, there's characters, so she could have explain what she didn't get out of the story that she wanted to hear more of. Did they want to, she want to hear more about the person, the character? A little more uh, visual in the story. She didn't point that out. It was just, I wanted to hear more of that. Yes? So instead of starting the sentence with I, it make it more of an action. When you said, when you did, the example of, and then it's not, me, 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 me. It's you, you, you. It's what you did. It's what was effective. It's what I'll always remember about this speech. Yeah, the next time you can do this. Uh, the other thing that she used, and this is another word that we have to be careful for, this is part of neurolinguistic programming, is the words we use impact us. When you say, but, Virginia, that is a beautiful top, but I like, it comes. <laughs> I like it better in purple. Now, what did I just do to her? I complimented her on the top, and I complimented her on the, another color, but I took it away from her. So be careful with the but, and in private, and. I like your sweater. Virginia, and if you have it in purple, I think the color would be great on you. Awesome, I'll be look for it. <laughs> so you use the and word, you had this great story, but you didn't talk about the character. You had this great story, and I think if you really talked a little bit more about the character, the character would have come alive. If you were in the moment, telling a story. So that's what I'm saying, be careful with the words you use, because again, the words you use are going to be impactful. Can I ask, yes. should, should she have pointed out the lack of the handshake with the contest chair at the beginning? I was no. no. tired of it. That was, yeah, that was probably 10 or 15 yeah. seconds. Is that 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 make, I actually wrote that down. Is that yeah, going to make your speech better? No. No. That's a Toastmaster protocol. protocol. Yeah. That's it. If she didn't even bring it up, judges probably wouldn't even notice it. Right. And it now, wasn't and it wasn't useful to the speaker. It wasn't useful to the speaker. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, next time I gotta go shake hands. That's oh. probably all they'll remember. That helped the speaker at all. Yeah. yeah. Right. So no. Don't worry about the protocol. If the judges pick it up, maybe the judges might even take a point off of it. Maybe your long time speaker you know. <laughs> Toastmasters. But that's not important about the speech. It's about the speech. It's about the delivery. If she was going to, if they were going to present that speech outside, there is no protocol as far as male yeah, Toastmaster and Mr. Toastmaster. Right. In some cultures, um, when I was helping out a Muslim club, um, a man and woman who are not married cannot shake hands. So they typically bow. So it's going to be to where you're at. But you want to pick, since you only have a limited amount of time, you want to try and really think about what would be the most impactful change, recommendation, that will help change that speech, the most impactful. And then the, the things that you thought were most important about what you liked about it. If, uh, 
because you're again you're only going to have you might have six things th six things that you wrote down, but you're only going to have time to go in depth with maybe three or four. So, okay, let's go to the next. Let's go to yeah, go to the next one. Okay. Us. Masters and Kitta, I loved your speech. <laughs> Thank you for a vivid and relatable topic. I think all of us have had something to do with this crazy little thing called love. But there were things that really stood out for me, Kitta, and the first was before you opened your mouth. You stood up here with poise and presence while a technical glitch went on around you, and I think you won the audience before you said a word. And then when you started speaking, I discovered that we had a word wizard in our midst. From rhyme, you had the imagination and exaggeration. You spoke about, let me explain, as we walked down memory lane. You used this beautiful speaker's triplet of seek it, nurture it, strike again. Beautiful language that painted pictures that we could all see and imagine. But what I loved was you didn't just paint pictures with your words, you painted pictures with your body. And you had that longing for love and the yearning. And then you used body language to add to your humor. And you had humor in bucket loads. And when you started having the conversation with your lady, that awkward conversation I think all men have gone through, you really painted that picture and then added to the humor with a phew. So that was fantastic. And I really want to commend you for that. The things that I think you could work on, there's three things, and they're not huge, Keta, but the one is you use these beautiful words and you had great vocal variety, but you have quite a gentle voice. And at times, I don't know if everyone could hear you. And so my suggestion is when you speak in a room like this, come and do quite a long mic practice and ask your mentor to stand at the back of the room and see how you're projecting and help them push that. Okay, so that's something I think you could work on. The other thing, was I loved that you brought the song in. We all know the song, which was fantastic, but I felt like you suddenly lost a little bit of confidence that I'm standing up here and I'm singing. I just want to get this bit over with my speech. There was a chance to own that, because that really added to a speech, so you could have even interacted with us. This thing called love. You know, you really could have gone for it. So next time, go for it, own it, because you deserve to be on this stage. And that brings me to my last point and recommendation thing I think you could work on is your speech was relevant to us and you kept asking these great questions. Would you die for love? Would you lose everything for love? But you didn't give the audience a chance to respond. And you work us, that's your chance. Would you die for love? And if they don't say anything, you go, would you die for love? Would you? Okay, come on. I mean, you, you really get them going. But those opportunities I felt that you missed and you could work on. But in summation, just Work the mic to understand and compensate for the gentleness of your voice so that you can add volume to it. Interact with your audience. Commit to the brave things like putting a song into your speech. Keep up your humor. Keep up your body language. Keep up your word wizardry. And when it comes to this crazy little thing called speech making, seek it, nurture it, and please strike again. Now, I've got a dumb question on that. That evaluation to me seemed like a scatterbrain, all over the place thing. It wasn't specific. How in the heck could she win? Was she a winner? Yeah, number one. She was good. Yeah. She should have been. Now, I mean, tell me. How could it have been more specific? Well, I, I guess maybe when I do evaluations, this might be where my thing is. I, I try to get into very good, tell them what they really did well and then get specifically two or three areas of improvement with some very specific suggestions. I don't know, I just felt like she was... She said you had beautiful language and came up with like 10 examples of beautiful language. She said painted pictures with your body and came up okay. with explicit examples of the body language. She said you did a wonderful summary and then the examples of what she could have improved were come in, you know, you're, you have okay. a quiet, you know, get on the mic and bring a friend and practice. Right. She said you lost confidence, own it, and then demonstrate how she might be able to own it. And then said you didn't give people a chance to respond, you could have interacted yeah. with them. I, I wonder how she okay. could have been more explicit. Like, it felt really okay. rich and very smoothly 
where it wasn't as noticeable as like, do this, do this, do this. It just went in. <laughs> okay. So this is where we get into personal preference, right? Okay. And you're going to have that with the judges. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some judge will probably accept, would have said, man, that was a lot of stuff. And another judge might say, are you kidding me? It's the best evaluation I've ever heard. And so that's why you want to have at least five judges, so that you get a, a varied opinion. Now, what was the difference between this one and the last one? She was specific. Yes. Uh, she also All spoke throughout. to the speaker. It wasn't about her. She spoke to the speaker and, and advocated for the audience not being able to hear her very, uh, and, and good choice of words in her timid voice, or however she said that. You're very light spoken, soft, soft spoken. Gentle. Yeah, gentle, gentle voice. That's what it was. In the way she personal. said that, she didn't say, I know everyone else couldn't hear you. Right. Uh, she said, yeah. I don't know if they could hear you yes. right. very well. That I suggest, and so, so that's how you answer for the audience. Um, what else did she do? What else did you like about it? Yes. Well, I like her subjectivity. I like the same thing. We're all jumping on the other lady for doing it mm -hmm. negatively. I think the reason I liked it was she she was very plain spoken with reasons why her subject. I, I heard her be just as subjective as the previous one. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear more. And she was saying, I love this. I love it because how do I love you? Let me count the ways. I mean, she was giving tangible examples of her subjective reaction. But I, my, my take was that they were both very subjective. It's just the, the second lady made it very tangible and clear why. Mm -hmm. I like how she repeated the speaker's words back to her in the yes. summation. I thought that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And that's good as, a, as an evaluator. When you're in the contest, because you know, they, they know that you listened. So you she can spent, listen but not remember. What? Okay. I said you can listen but not remember. <laughs> so she had an opening, and then she went to tell her what she liked about her speech, and then she <coughs> went to the three recommendations, and then she had her summary. There's your formula. Mm -hmm. She was witty. Yeah. I mean, she entertaining, had a lot of witty. Yeah. They both were. She actually did a uh, TED Talk. Found her oh, doing talk. She was a good speaker and she used the stage well. Yes. Yeah. I think there's a distinction in here, at least when I hear evaluations on speeches that I've done. I hear people saying, if I was going to do this speech, this is what I would have done, versus uh, the use of the stage where you can be driven by what the speech is about to one side of the stage to the other is more of a comment on uh, improving the speech quality, not an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, she used the specifics. There was no choice about it. Uh, so I don't think she uh, had her personal opinions in there. She, she had provided with a good speaking sense rather than opinion. This is the way I would have done. Yeah. And she, she presented it well. But you always can say, you know, I would suggest, or you might consider this. Because again, not all of, not all of us have it's the same, I'll call you. <laughs> you know, everyone has a different opinion. So I might have one opinion, and Steve might have a different opinion. So I'm not going to speak for the audience. But I could say, I might suggest, you, you know, you consider doing this. Because it's going to depend on your speech and how you want to deliver it. So you're going to listen to some, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to do that, and I'm not going to do this. Yes. Jesus. Oh, the, the only thing Could I was you raise your hand? Well, she's been like this for a long time, I think. Is that enough questions or no? No, I, I just wanted to say I liked the way she used her notes. She didn't hold them and walk around with them, but when she needed them, she walked over, glanced at them, and and that was it. So I think that, you know, that's a good example of how the, if you have something specific, it's okay to look at your notes. Just oh, yeah. don't walk around with them and waving them in everyone's faces. Okay. So I would suggest. <laughs> that you can take up this blank form. Well, now you have just that sheet. 
and everyone's going to have that sheet. And so if you want to bring it up and lay it down on the lectern or... So we have, yes. have something? I just had a comment that in this case it didn't matter that she used the word but. She used it five times at every recommendation. You know, you... Um, but, you know, you, you did well, but, but your voice was slow. You, you, had, you were singing, but then you lost confidence. You choose the word but in every recommendation, but it didn't matter because you won. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and I noticed that she used it a lot. But what I'm saying is, we don't hear that unless we start practicing it. Do we have so, to try so hard to yeah. avoid the word but? I think we are yeah. not and true. No, and you can't do it all the time, but you have to try to be careful as far as how you use it. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it can come off more negative than... My negative. personal opinion, I don't like the sugar coating to avoid, but just because you... I mean, are we so weak? So <laughs> but we are hardening? I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. No, it's okay. But I feel like, but it ain't so work. Yeah. I mean, if you want to use it, just use it. And, and yeah. for a speaker, if you can, you can be heard by a butt, then you, you shouldn't be a Toastmaster. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, I was just going to comment on that. Yeah. The, the uh -huh. no but and replacing that with yes and is a sales technique. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you'll just, there's always a better way to say it, and there's always a nicer way to say it. And it, so what you do is you agree with somebody. And then you say, and, so right. I agree with you, and, you know, this, I also think this. So I think there, there is always a way to kind of express that with you, yeah. and. So, yeah. And it's, it's just more introduction, too, how you use it. But you're not going to use it all the time. I understand that. I don't use it all the time. I use but. But if we start practicing it a little bit. <laughs> but, yes. It, that but is an additive but. So that's, that's the distinction I'm going to make. What you just said was built on the thought. You built on the thought, you, you got the first sort of sentence out, and then you built on the thought to add the extra piece to it. Our first speaker literally would say something like, it was a great speech, but, but, you know, whereas, whereas this was an additive. I, I thought what she was doing was, here's where, here's where you did well, and then here's where you can improve, it can improve. So where she used it, she was adding to the thought. It wasn't like, you did great, you did horrible. It's more of a, you did really good up until this point, and you can now improve. And I think that's, right. to your point, yeah, you can add to it. And that, I think, is where she never, it doesn't she, feel like you're getting slapped around. She never took it away from the speaker. She never right. took it away from the speaker. Right. So if it is a distinction, she used technically the word but, but it was an additive to how she can really improve. And the tone of voice. Yes, yes. How she the tone of voice is, is huge. I have seen Jerry do 20 minutes without any connective words at all. He's able to end a sentence, start the next sentence, keep the point on point at the same time. It's not necessary. I'm not saying I'm against it, but I think that it comes out clearer. But not everybody's Jerry Evans. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding, dude. Really, how come the number of butts you use for? That's not an evaluation. They don't, right? The judge? No. I'm telling you, the judge can do anything they want. There's no Toastmaster police that's going to stop them. People count the number of laughs. I had somebody the other day who told me that I got a laugh every 17 seconds. Oh my God. Seriously. Huh. Okay. Is that good? Is that bad? What's Was the it press? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so, you know, some judges, if, it, if that's a word that bugs them, you betcha they're going to take you up. <laughs> I didn't even notice when that lady said it. Mm -mm. And in your, con in your contest, which I think it's important to point out, the person who won the area contest that Virginia competed in, in a different area, not her area, she was constantly back and forth. She was pacing across the staging area. She never looked at the target speaker oh, once. Yeah. Once. And she won? And For she the won. the other area, yes. She, she won. Never, she never even directed her focus towards the target speaker once. She's an actress. 
Yeah, oh. she's production and theater and production. So she, and she well, wowed them. My next she question. Did. She did. For the evaluation contest, I noticed one phenomenon. Where were interesting? It, it's all up to the judge. Really? Right. In my opinion, evaluation is evaluation. It's not performance. Right. But some of the contests I saw, the evaluator was performing so yeah. much. Yeah. It's almost yeah. left her. Was doing that. It's like a canned evaluation. That's what I mean, I was so, I was kind some of judges, mad. Some judges are well about yeah. the, the drama. Right. Some right. aren't. But again, it's not about you performing up there. You should be animated, bring the energy. Because uh, there was one, I didn't bring it, but there was one where the energy was very low. Yes, you did a great speech. So it's the energy, too, that, what? So it's the energy that you're going to bring to the to it that's going to help you, too. Because that also influences the audience as a speaker, as an evaluator, as a business person. So the evaluation, um, so bring the energy, too. Okay, um, we're going to go on to the next one. Oh, this, yeah. uh, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the speech, the District 30, and then we're going to listen to the press. So take notes. I want to here. I want you to take notes on the speaker. Can I just share one thing. Yes. Perez told me at a conference that before this, he had watched a couple of hundred speeches and done evaluations on them, sitting in his living room. So you, the people who put in the time. They know and acquire the skill, and he's very analytic. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was a new Toastmaster <coughs> was a shock to everyone until you talk to him and find out how much time he put into developing his craft. How was and the he created his own formula. He did. For evaluating. Mm -hmm. And that's like, how was, how was the never going to be good unless you practice. Right. I was the contest Toastmaster when Prez first competed. And he had been in Toastmasters at that point about seven and a half months. He had a notebook that he carried with him. At that point, he had done 100 evaluations. At that point. And he still takes notes. Oh, he does. Copious notes. Yeah. Yeah. He's very analytical. When you need a surgery, you go to the person who's done That's it right. a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> you don't okay. want to be the first one. So I want you to take notes. Remember the formula. If you want to use this. Start practicing, but uh, so take notes and then see. We'll talk about it. Okay. For my career, education. Because we had fishing, we 
had goals. We had opportunities. I loved it. I fell in love with my job. Almost as much as I fell in love with my to be future wife. It turned sour, but it turned sour slowly. It became tedious. It became a chore. Yet, for some reason, I felt that it was my duty, my obligation, a matter of honor, to stick with this job, no matter what. This company was going to become the best in the world. We were going to be the next Google, the next Microsoft, the next whatever. It was going to be number one. And yet, I could not win. Although we need dedicated employees, although we need people with talent and ambition, you as an individual cannot fix a company. You may be able to inspire change. You may be able to lead others. But if the rest of the organization doesn't follow, you just become a cog in a machine. And that's what happened. Slowly over time, this ambitious, young startup organization became more and more political. It became a bureaucracy. Now, as an individual, I did well. I steadily rose to the ranks. Towards the end of my career, I had many, many perks. I could work from home whenever I wanted to. I had a very nice income. I had a corner office in downtown Chicago. You would say that by all means I was successful, but I was miserable because I did not have the challenge. I did not have the goal. I was not given a goal. You need leadership and love to tell you what challenges to tackle, what problems to solve. And unfortunately, it was just an endless cycle of projects. We're starting a new project, it's going to change everything. Oh, this is great. Oh, wait, this project stopped. Well, maybe we shouldn't do that. No, 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 no. We did the wrong project. We have a new project. It's going to be very good. <laughs> I see some of you were in the workforce. <laughs> It was slowly destroyed. I didn't realize it at the time because I was so immersed in trying to improve, in trying to win, in trying to make the situation better. And then it happened. As I said, I had the privilege of working from home whenever I wanted to, which I respected. I had actually set up a quite nice home office away from my kids and wife who was secluded. Everything I needed to be just as productive as if I was in the office. Often I was more productive at home because I was able to focus on projects that would eventually be canceled. <laughs> and then I got the phone call. We're sorry, but with the economy the way it is, we're letting people go. You are one of them. This is not about performance. It's just a restructure. Of course, I was shocked. And then, to add insult to injury, they cut my phone. <laughs> so now, with no doubt, I had a moment of clarity. It was as if a, as if a lightning bolt had struck me and I was between the two people. The emotional side and the logical side. The emotional side was angry. How dare they do this? I was a good employee. A good organization would have made sure to have done this properly. They would have made sure I was in the office. They would have told me to my face. On the logical side, stepped up and said, that's all true. But if it was a well-run organization, there wouldn't be layoffs. <laughs> Logic goes away. But what I didn't realize was that it was a complete and total blessing. You see, the moment I was laid off, I had time to think about well, what do I want? What do I like? What makes me a good person? It's really about what you like, what, what you enjoy. And suddenly I found myself thinking, I don't like being a techie in the back room. I like to be in front of people, sharing ideas. I don't like being a person who's going down the charts. 
unidentified person who was asking others for their input. I realized that I was not, as I had been, a senior systems engineer. I was sort of a salesperson. That's what I am today. I am a solutions architect. I design solutions. I work with the sales team. So I've got the best of both worlds. I can stay technical, and I have no quarterly number to me. <laughs> but when I found that passion, when I found what I really wanted to do, suddenly I found another job. And surprisingly, my career is gone. I now make more money. More importantly, I learn more. Best of all, I have more fun. That playoff was the best thing for my career. It kicked me out of the nest that I had grown too accustomed to. Forced me to find what I really enjoy. If you ever go through such a situation, you have my pity. It is a tough time, but look at it as what it is. Liberation. It's a moment to refocus. A moment to discover who you really are. Thank you. Good humor. Good humor. <laughs> Good energy. Good energy. Okay, like the story, he had a lot of detail where he talked about time, place, and setting. Now, how did he use the energy? He was animated. Okay. Uh, he was Good voice. Okay. Who else? Uh, just off of that, I was going to say he used it with uh, describing how he felt. He had emotion. Mm -hmm. So, what about the emotion? Go into more detail on that. Uh, I like I like the emotion that you brought to your story. <coughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you just did a great job at really explaining uh, the detail of the scene so far. Or just the way he did it, it just kind of like came back to me and I had to fix it. Now, he didn't have the same energy throughout the whole speech. No. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, it was humor, joking, and then he was talking about what was going on, and then when he lost his job, his voice changed, the emotion dropped, you could feel that pain. So when you're evaluating, you can talk a little bit about that, about how you saw the energy at the beginning, and then when he got to that story, that's what we want. In a storyteller, we want them to show us the emotion, so that it impacts your audience. And you can say, it, 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 you know, the audience, if the audience feels it, then you've impacted them. Uh, what else? Donna? I thought he made good use of the stage, and most of the time he moved on purpose when he was actually changing the topic or point he was making. And one more. A very strong, inspirational close, I thought, mm -hmm. how he went mm -hmm. from a horrible situation that could have been the best situation that he'd had, and mm -hmm. that uh, there, was, there was a real benefit and a positive uh, thing in his life. And that was his purpose. He might, be, he might find it inspirational, he might, he might find it entertaining, and so he told us that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to Prez's uh, presentation. Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you very much. We're going to stop it, Roger. Just, just real quick, something he, I thought he did really adeptly that I, you rarely see handled well was he came out and gave an introduction that had absolutely nothing to do with his speech. And he instantly sort of made himself very, very likable by relating to this evaluation content. had nothing to do with the speech. And he had this really adept transition from that into the story, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Making that work is really mm -hmm. tough. And I would like to go back to that video and really study how he did it because it was... It was just a seamless transition between the two that oftentimes would feel really tough and clunky, but it didn't feel clunky at all. No, I thought he did, he did it very well. Very with the audience, the audience <coughs> We were on the side. He was he was the hero in the story automatically, and that was really well done. I thought. Yeah, because we liked to make it. Right, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Postmaster, fellow postmasters, distinguished guests, and especially Patrick. What a way to open up speech by acknowledging the audience, by referring to the 
different distance and saying, you know what guys? I'll make some mistakes for you. <laughs> That's a way to connect. Human connects. Now I'm ready to listen to your message. What a message it was. A personal story. Something you've experienced that has changed your life. And it's the power of the story. It gives you credibility. You've been there, you've done that. But it also gives you conviction and passion. Did he speak from his heart today? Yes. And that's a way to connect. I was particularly excited how you connected the story to the power of transformation. You got to your lesson to a personal transformation. But did you notice that there were two types of transformation? There was the common, it was small, and then you, it was great to anyone. And then there was a personal connection of how you discovered that that's not the place for you. That was great. That was engaging. How can I make it a better, more powerful speech? Nothing. I know that you like to keep your hands up. And would suggest at times to relax them to the sun. Because I learned from Craig Vanna that if everything sticks out, nothing. Right now, my vision of speaking is focused on bringing energy to the speeches that I give. Mm -hmm. And I've been taking uh, a lot of look at uh, Leo Viscalia. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him. 
Yeah. Uh, he is a fantastic speaker, and he epitomizes uh, energy in his, in his speech. Mm -hmm. And I watched with Roger here a whole bunch of his, and he determined that he will raise the noise up a higher octave. He will lean forward into the people, and he'll be louder, and his words will be faster. So his pace is the same, but he'll put more words in, in, into a bar, mm -hmm. uh, just like eighth notes instead of quarter notes. And that's what Fred did. Mm -hmm. I was watching him, he says, there's Leo right there. Uh, and, it, and it brought a lot of energy to his speech. What he does, which I like also, which Leo doesn't do as much, he does more dramatic pauses in his speeches. Press, press does more pauses in his speeches, which I like a lot, uh, which pulls us into his speeches. So that's what I was looking at. Uh, of course, the other stuff that was there, but that's what I saw. Yes. What I liked was his movement, his body language, but not the usual. I would have thought, okay, I'm getting a call, and I would have gone like this to a phone. But he pointed in a whole different off-stage direction when I get that call. Mm -hmm. As if, okay, the phone's way over there or something. And it was just a lot different than the usual hand motions of a phone being called. And that made a more of an impact to me. Wider. Wider. Right. The whole body language is, yep. is wider. And for those of you who don't know, does it have, does, who doesn't know who presents? Prez Bazilif is our 2013 world champion of public speaking. So a year after that, a year and a half after that. This, no? Yeah, he won a year and a half after this. And the way he did his training, and training himself for the speech evaluation, he did the same thing for his speaking. He belongs to five or six clubs, and he would practice and practice listening to speakers and get trained, training himself, taking notes. So um, he, so he does bring a lot of his speaking skills that he trained into the evaluation too. Anything else that you liked what he did? Sure. He was human throughout. Mm -hmm. yeah. But with heart. There was so much of his heart, it was very personal. Mm -hmm. Just like the speaker spoke from his heart, so the press, which yeah. I thought was really and that joke about the hands was brilliant. I don't think I'll ever forget that. <laughs> uh, all right, and then what do you think he could improve? He could have improved that. <clears throat> Who, Prez or the speaker? Prez. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comments because Prez, to me, I, I know him too well. I filmed him too much. <laughs> <laughs> Just your opinion. Yeah, I, I had a visceral reaction to the not <clears throat> Uh, it very much felt like, let me show you how bad a speaker you are by outperforming you in spades. And let me give this really, you know, like, everything was so, it, who mentioned the performance thing? It felt like a performance. So the idea of everything stands out, nothing can. I can include that in every evaluation I do in the next year. I can have these canned jokes that I can put in, and everyone's going to laugh, and boom. <coughs> it, to me, it felt like, here, let me show everyone else what a great speaker I am. And at some point, I wasn't even kind of like, is he really addressing the speaker? Or is he making a performance about how great a speaker he is? To, it, just, it felt weird. It felt, it felt, it didn't feel helpful to me in any way. It felt like I, I need to be drawn into the dramatics of this thing. It's like, no, it's just an evaluation. It doesn't have to be dramatic. That's, it felt too dramatic. That's my sentiments. I was trying to talk with Press. I know how hard he worked, but you know he's phenomenal. He's no, no, phenomenal. No, no. Speaker. What, what, I can't what, take what, anything away from what him. What I'm simply saying, and it, I know this will be taped, and he'll probably kill me for saying <laughs> this, but you know, he's a good speaker. He practices a lot, but sometimes there's a little bit more of over practicing, over performing. Sometimes you got to speak from the heart, and, and 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 be genuine. But it's a hard balance to do. Like I said, I've never gone past area or even division. He's won the international speaking contest. Yeah, right. Now, what I want you to do is start thinking about what you can take away from what the evaluators did well. And 
on what you see could be improved on the evaluator side, and then see how you can incorporate the, the good qualities into your speech. And you want to have the formula in your head. It's what is it? What's a formula? You mean sense? No. 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 You have an opening, a quick opening, and then you're going to. Then what? About what they did well. Tell them what they did well. Recommendation. Recommendations. Summary. Summary. Yeah. Okay. And what I want to do, I'm Chris. <coughs> so the first part with the the opening and then what they did well, it was a, a minute and 65 seconds. Wow. Suggestions was a minute and 12 seconds. And the summary was 34 seconds. So when you practice, you know, go on YouTube. I actually have a slide I can send you of the speakers if you want. I can send you the links that you can go and review these if you wanted to. You wanted to review one. Um. So, but you can go on YouTube, just Google contest, evaluation contest, or speaking uh, um, humorous or international, right. whatever it is you want to practice. And then it'll bring, it'll bring up a lot of the speeches and the evaluations. Then see what that what their formula is for each of the speakers. Two two of the speakers I only listened to two of the speakers from D30 when the press spoke, and two of them didn't do a summary. In fact, they were all they were all advanced speakers, and one of them finished at. 2.95 minutes and didn't do a summary. So we actually had time to do a summary. Now when we get up in front of an audience, sometimes we get nervous <laughs> and we might forget something. So it's if you do your little outline on your on your blank form, <laughs> do your outline on here so that you remember what you need to talk about so that you don't forget your summary. And watch each segment according to the time, with the, the green, the yellow, and the red, so that you kind of program yourself to, OK, once it gets to the green, where am I? Once it gets to the yellow, where do I have to be? Once it gets to the red, I better summarize. Mm -hmm. Because that's about all you have left once it gets to the red. And because otherwise you start talking really fast like I do at the very end and then have some reason. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes, Jeff. Is Chris? He's from this area? Yes. yes. He lives in Chicago. Well, he's district. from Bulgaria, right? Yeah. He's from Bulgaria. What? Well, uh, yeah, that's living. He's from our district. He uh, lives he's in Chicago. Mostly in the city. Yeah. He's in his, one of his home clubs is another one that meets on Wednesday night. It's, uh, I'll, I, I think it's called, uh, it's another advanced club. Well, well that's Windy City Toastmasters. But not, primary, not Windy City. His, it's primary, some... his primary club was Lincoln Park Toastmasters. His next club was Extreme Toastmasters. That's the one I'm thinking of. That's the one that meets downtown, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he belongs to us. He's also very Thanks. approachable. Yeah. He did that. He's also I very... because a lot of times they'll ask Chris to come speak at a TLI or um, at, a, at a conference or mm -hmm. something. So when you see him on there, he gives excellent oh, presentations. Yeah. Excellent. Very organized, lots of, lots of good material. Make sure you get to the districts, to all the training that you can when you see that there's going to be a speaker there. Because usually, usually we have really good speakers. So for you, when you leave, if you're in a contest, Download this every year, so because it's a little bit different every year before you present, so that you know what the rules are, any changes in it. This is your new form, and I'll, if you leave me your email, I'll send you the links for the videos that we had today, so you can go and view, view them again if you want to. The forms that you got, I know there's a lot of forms, look at them and just kind of absorb them to see what what points you can use to improve your evaluations and that only evaluation of your speech is also. So, uh, Jerry?
couple things just to wrap this up. Toastmasters on purpose, we do these workshops for our own benefit so we can learn and continue to grow as Toastmasters, but we also, it's our way of paying it forward to other Toastmasters. We get the opportunity, everybody in the club, 60, 70 percent of us are distinguished Toastmasters, and everyone else is at advanced, you know, working on advanced manuals, belongs to multiple clubs. So I would encourage all of you who've never been to Top before for one of our regular meetings to come back on October the 5th. It's on your agendas. That'll be our next regular meeting and experience what a regular meeting is like. We love doing these workshops because did you learn something tonight? Did you yes, take away yes. some real value? Definitely. I know I did, and you know, we've done a number of these workshops and always listening to Val and then you get a new perspective. It's just kind of like you get your mind working a little bit different directions. It makes you think about different things, the way that you're currently evaluating, and things that we can all do to improve. Tony is an example. Tony belongs to Mount Prospect Toastmasters. And Tony, I know, he has his own form that he's devised that works well for him. It gives him a construct and a format that it keeps him on task in the way that he wants to evaluate. Val has a form that she uses. Press developed, devised a form that he uses. Does that work for each and every one of us? No. Like she said, that's why she gave you samples, copies of different ones. You can figure out taking some of those things and devising a construct and a format that works for yours. But I think Val summed it up by saying, you've got to develop a mental construct, your own mental form. Because when it comes time for you to compete in a contest, you need to know how you're going to approach it. We've all seen Toastmasters. All of you, a lot of you in the room know Barry Nixon. Barry Nixon's the only Toastmaster in District 30 that's won all five contests in the history of Toastmasters, not just District 30. We have four, but he's won multiple times on a couple of them. Okay, but he's five-time district champion. The reason I bring up Barry, because to, to Val's point, he was in a contest, the South Division contest, and I was there. He did a fantastic evaluation. He did everything right, except what did he miss, Val? The summer. The summer. That cost him the contest. And after it was all done, I said, B. Anyway, I said, why do you think you didn't win? He goes, the summer is. <laughs> that was the difference between him winning. I mean, because he, he blew everybody out of the way. He was animated, he had a humor to it, everything that president in his evaluation but he missed the summary, and that cost him the division contest. Otherwise, he would have gone on the district again right. to compete in evaluation. So that can happen, just keeping in mind to follow, follow that format, and it works. The last piece of business is that... The forms that I got, that yes. I gave you, are on Google. You can just Google evaluation forms and a whole bunch of Google. So our next, like I said, our, our regular meeting is October the 5th, and there are a contest that I just want to make you aware of. I think most of you are aware of some of the division contests, but for the Northwest Division, which we're part of, that takes place on October the 8th. Okay. And that's going to be right here at Harper. It'll be in the D building in Lecture Hall D195. It's an awesome lecture hall. <coughs> For a contest, it seats about 150 people. We're trying to break the record for the Northwest Division for uh, the most number of people attending a division contest. Right now, we do hold a record when we had a contest there a number of years ago in Z102, we had 120 people. The most ever for a division contest. It'd be great if we could break okay. that. But more importantly, to go listen to the speakers and to listen to the evaluations. Donna will be competing, so we want to certainly go and cheer her on along with the other contestants because it's always nice for. I'm going to just give me a moment. A uh, few give others. Moment. <laughs> so Donna will be representing one part, and then Val is competing because Val won in her area. She's a member of Lake Zurich Toastmasters, where Donna is a member of. Mount Prospect Toastmasters, so come and support both of them, along with, <laughs> hold on, I'm talking about evaluation right now. Oh, I'll get through. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side, other than evaluation, Donna and Bob are competing in Humorous. Yeah. And Bob is a member of Toastmasters on Purpose. He originally competed 
in Crystal Lake Toast Matches. So he'll represent Top in the division contest, and Donna will be representing Mount Prospect Toastmasters. And the humorous speeches. By Virginia. I'm in the North Division. She's in the North Division. <laughs> well, he was talking about Northwest. So we can do the Northwest Division. I'm sorry, Northwest is best. What can I say? But anyway, Virginia, Virginia, Virginia's competing September the 29th. She'll be competing in the North Division contest. Beth Weinstein is the division director for the North Division. And that is September the 29th, which is next week, Thursday. Where? Aon Hewitt All right. up in Lincolnshire. It is on the district calendar, so you can check that out and go support Virginia. But the contest, you have fun at them. Tim. Shall we close with a jingle? No. <laughs> <laughs> so again, on behalf of Toastmasters on Purpose, thank you all for coming this evening. We hope you got a lot of value. We hope to see you again. If it's not October 5th, come back for another meeting. And we would love to have you consider being a part of Toastmasters on Purpose, because we are the only advanced Toastmasters club in the Northwest Division. Have a great night, and have a great rest of your week. I call this